Hey, on today's episode, we are going to be covering how to improve profits through humanizing healthcare with guest Rafi Salazar. And this is Dave Kittle on The Dave Kittle Show. I'm the owner of Concierge Pain Relief Home Physical Therapy in New York City and the owner and CEO of the Fieldmaker Group. We're currently acquiring practices in the New York and New Jersey area. And today we have Rafi Salazar on the podcast. He recently published a new book, Better Outcomes, the title, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. We're going to have a link to the Amazon link in the show notes. Rafi, welcome back on. Hey, thanks for having me. Excellent. So before we get into the book, give the audience, in case they haven't heard about you before, give the audience a little bit of a background. Uh, You're a practice owner, you're a therapist, an entrepreneur, a consultant, many other things. Uh, Tell the audience a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into the book. Sure. Yeah, I'm an occupational therapist by trade. Um, probably the the biggest chunk of my career thus far has been uh, upper extremity rehabilitation through the Department of Veterans Affairs. Left there in 2017 to do consulting. Worked on a couple big projects, a multi million dollar project for the Department of Behavioral Health here in Georgia, doing integrated clinical care models and setups and service delivery. Helped them transition to virtual service delivery, and then I've been working with private practice owners around the idea of patient engagement, retention, all of that kind of stuff. And then in 2020, I purchased a clinic of my own, Proactive Rehab and Wellness here in Augusta, Georgia, and we do PTOT, aquatic therapy, the like. Got it. And we're going to get into the new book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. But what's really in it for the private practice owner? I mean, I think a lot of practice owners, they realize like, yeah, it sounds great, of course, you know, humanizing healthcare, all of that makes a lot of sense. And I think arguably for a lot of PTs and OTs, I think we already do a lot of this instead of the five minute visits that might be elsewhere in in healthcare, not to, you know, demean any of that. But when we're talking about improving profits through healthcare for any private practice owner listening, what's like an initial quick win or, or a little bit of a starting point for them that we can speak to? Yeah, I think the reason I really wanted to write the book was because while clinically PTs and OTs are great at making a strong connection and building relationships and all that kind of stuff. The process of care at any of these clinics tends to be very regimented, industrialized, conveyor belt-ish, if you would. So what I wanted to do is craft a, a framework, if you would, that allows clinicians the ability to, to make that relationship and build that relationship with a prospective patient or a prospective client from before they even book an appointment with your clinic, and that makes them more likely to be engaged. So they're going to show up to that evaluation or consult. They're going to be more bought in before they even schedule that appointment. So they'll be more likely to uh, adhere to those home exercise plans and and home programs and then continue their course of care. So the research is is fairly, fairly consistent over the last 10 or 12 years that seven out of 10 patients that are referred primarily to physical medicine, physical occupational therapy, don't complete their course of care. And I mean, that's uh, from a standpoint of financial numbers. I mean, you're talking, I think WebPT said it was, a what, $6.2 billion in lost revenue last year for patients just dropping off the schedule. So this is a, a way of kind of clawing back some of that, that potential revenue without having to do any real extra ad spend or marketing or, or any of the stuff that you see on, on the socials these days. Buy this ad and you'll we'll flood your clinic with patients. Well... If you just stop the sieve, the leaking out of the of the bucket, if you would, of those patients that are already in the clinic, you're able to capitalize, get more revenue per each client, and then you're also able to help more people because they're going to actually be meeting their goals, achieving their their plans of care, and and leaving you more happy and satisfied, which means they're hopefully referring more friends and neighbors and and coming back to you too. In regards to that, is there with the humanizing healthcare conversation? especially let's just say outpatient physical therapy, outpatient occupational therapy, the consumer, the the patient, the client, they actually, they have to enjoy it, right? Like they have to like it. And yeah. if they do, then they would be more likely to return, right? So it means like a like a pleasant atmosphere, positive, things can't be negative. There, there can't be any, I don't know, like infighting with staff and things like that. So what are some things there in terms of uh, considerations or components around the, the, enjoyability of an experience, even if someone just had surgery, even if someone is dealing with yeah. really bad sciatica or something like that? Yeah, I think it, it's it's twofold, right? The first one is kind of not selling, but communicating the value that you provide. So the, the patient or the client needs to 
understand from the beginning that what they're getting is something of value. They need to see the value in it. And there's a whole chapter in the book about communicating, confidently communicating the value you provide. And then the other piece is like the physical environment, right? The space itself, accessibility, how easy it is to to park, to to get through the the actual facility itself, all of that kind of stuff. And that does have an impact in whether or not patients show up again and whether they see the value in the services. So there is research out there that does show that the physical environment or the context, if you would, does impact a person's perception of what they're about to receive. And I'm sure you've seen this, right? Like if you go into a restaurant and the floor is greasy and the light is dim and dingy and there's like a musty smell, you're not really prepared to have a, a wonderful meal experience, right? So it's, it's the same thing walking into a health clinic. At the same time, we don't want it to be this super sanitized, like white coat, fluorescent lighting setup as well, because then you're kind of, um, you're purveying the, the experience or the perception or the expectation of kind of this kind of hierarchical hospital-based system, which, you know, puts a bad taste in some patients' mouths as well, right? So for owners, it's like trying to find the sweet spot in the middle. Exactly. Yeah. You want to be warm and welcoming and empathetic and friendly and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you want to show that what you're providing is a polished, professional and expertise service, as opposed to just your run-of-the-mill. What I tell people is like, you can walk into Walmart and grab coffee off of you know, 17 different shelves in a Walmart, you want to you want to avoid that as well. You want to avoid that commoditization that happens from just generic care. <laughs> right. And so for the book here on Amazon, the uh, the caption on the Amazon page, you wrote or it's listed, if it's not calculable, spreadsheetable or measurable, it hardly receives any attention from healthcare managers, administrators, and decision makers. And, you know, in some cases, you and I, we've been in a lot of therapy practices across the country, and we know that a lot of owners are probably less like numbers focused, and yeah. they, they already do offer a lot of the, like the humanistic side of things. So like, how could they still strive? Like, what else is in this book for them where they could still strive for maybe they need to you know, still focus on their numbers, but still deliver the quality care as if they're treating like their neighbor or their friend or something like that. Yeah, I think so. I've, I've seen this and you've probably seen this in some of the clinics that you've gone in and purchased or worked with where maybe it starts off and the, the clinician decides to go into practice by themselves because they want to deliver a higher standard of care. They want to have more control over the experience, all of that, which is great. And it's just them and maybe an admin or two and then they grow and they grow and they grow. And then they realize, okay, I've got this team of six, seven, eight clinicians. Things are kind of getting out of hand. I need to bring somebody in to show me kind of how to, how to become a business owner, not a practice owner. And what ends up happening is they hire some consultant, which, you know, I'm a consultant too. I'm not ragging on that. But what they end up getting is like a very like lean six sigma, industrialized MBA, if you would, run down on, on the business, which is great. A lot of clinicians don't have some of that business education coming out of school. The problem is, or the, the, the danger there is that you swing, the pendulum swings too much the other way. And instead of now being a small, privately held, uh, almost where that you've turned your calling into your enterprise, where this more of like your, your mission in the world, it becomes very much these practice owners are living and dying by the spreadsheets. You know, I'll have patients call me or, or clients call me and they're like, listen, you know, my revenue per visit went down by, you know, 0.03% or whatever it is. And they're freaking out or they're looking at the spreadsheet and they're seeing that the, the visits per, per month are going down a little bit or they're going up or, or whatever the deal is. And they're making all of these decisions based off of dashboards and cost per click and all of that kind of stuff, which... You do need to have a, ho a solid handle on the numbers. However, if everything becomes making the decisions to balance column A or make sure column B is in, in the black and not the red, you know, all of that kind of stuff, um, you end up losing and you detract from the value that private healthcare provides, which is the ability to step out of this industrialized, regimented, commoditized service. And if you swing too far into the, the spreadsheet side of things, you end up either moving more towards a vanilla service that 
is not really distinct, or you end up making, and this is the worst, the worst case, you end up making decisions that have real impact on the people receiving and delivering that care in a very negative way. And you're not really aware of it because what you're what you're focused on or what you're measuring are those metrics, those spreadsheets, those those dashboards that you're kind of living and dying by. So this book kind of hopes to to bring that into realignment where, yes, the numbers are important. And I do break down some numbers on some billing and some revenue side of things. But then we also couple that with how else can we measure performance for clinicians, for example, like is the only thing we're measuring productivity standards and utilization rates, because if that's all you're measuring, then you're incentivizing those clinicians to treat a certain way, as opposed to bringing in another measurement tool, maybe like the CARES survey or something like that, so that it's more balanced, so that you're looking at, okay, this is a productive employee, they're they're producing it at, at an adequate level, it's profitable, but they're also delivering a standard of care that leaves the patient feeling known, heard, listened to, and valued, which is super important for the engagement and retention side of things. Yeah. So a practice owner could be looking at their, you know, their visits or their units and, yeah. and their their income, the revenue is actually, it could be increasing. But what about the job satisfaction of the therapist? What if they don't realize it, but they're a month away from one of these therapists quitting or leaving? Burning out. Yeah. Or burning out in a way where they're, they want to, you know, work their less hours or they want to work their part-time and go work somewhere else or leave there completely. Uh, so what are some things that practice owners can do, what, whether it was what you just mentioned or any other um, any other metric or gauge where they can understand and gauge the therapists and the, uh, the doctors of PT or the OT that are satisfied and fulfilled in their job and enjoying like the work culture and the morale and the environment and, you know, delivering the, the plan of care and the treatment, all that. Are there things where you help practice owners? Uh, identify some of those things, whether it's uh, it could be weekly meetings, it could be weekly or monthly one on ones with your team members, it could be um, any other performance reviews, what are some things whether inside this book or outside that helps practice owners kind of get a, a pulse on their team? Like, are they truly happy? Are they fulfilled? Are they enjoying what they're doing? Yeah, no, um, I'm a big advocate of like quarterly meetings or quarterly reviews, and not so much like performance appraisal of review, reviews, but really just like a, I call them just like, where are we at meetings <laughs> with the clinicians? And we talk about those things like, okay, listen, last time we met, and we do, like I said, we, we promote a lot of these non utilization, non productivity metrics that can be used to help kind of bolster the professional and personal development of the clinician. So obviously, there's a baseline productivity standard, right? Like everybody needs to be a certain level of productivity in order just to keep the lights on. And that's what I tell the clinicians, like, listen, if you don't see this many patients or you don't bill appropriately, if there's a lot of missed opportunities, you know, that hurts everybody and it's going to hurt you eventually because we're going to have to start letting people go. <laughs> but then you don't want to make it all about the numbers. So we do have a, a, I will have conversations with clinicians in the clinic that I run and even with the the clients that I work with, like, okay, this method of billing, for example, or there, this we've noticed this pattern in your billing. So it might be the charges that are being uh, documented. It might be the way documentation is being completed or set up, all of that kind of stuff. We work on all of that. And then on top of that, kind of the, the, the second portion of that meeting is all about the human side of healthcare. Okay. So we're using the CARE survey, which is a validated measure, which has benchmarks nationally for the clinic itself and then individual clinicians that says, okay, it's 10 questions for the patient to fill out. And it's basically things like rate your provider on a scale of one to five. They made me feel heard. They made me feel listened to. They made me feel valued. They individualized my treatment plan. The stuff that's important to patients and the stuff that really uh, research shows is important for, for appropriate and, and positive clinical outcomes. And then we benchmark clinicians against that. Against that. And then it becomes that conversation with the, with the clinician becomes m more than just you're not billing enough or you're not seeing enough patients. It becomes, okay, we need to get the billing stuff squared away because that's how we all get paid. What's more important for us as management is that the patients that are showing up and seeing you feel like you actually care about them. They feel like you're individualizing the care and yet you're not providing cookie cutter treatment plans. They're sticking around and completing their course of care. So what I have done with some clients is tracked 
patients that have dropped off. So course of care completion, again, is a huge metric that everybody should be tracking because it's it's one of those that shows more than just um, just the, the billing and the metrics and, and all that kind of stuff. It actually shows patient satisfaction and engagement and all of that kind of stuff. So you can break it down and say, okay, you know, your peers in this clinic, you know, 80% of their patients are showing up for, you know, all of their appointments and they're completing their course of care. In your case, you're sitting at like 50%. Like, that's a problem. Like, what, are, what are you doing in your, in your care? What can we improve upon to make those patients feel engaged, feel bought in, feel like they're satisfied with the treatment that they're receiving so that they'll keep showing up? So there's more than one way to skin a cat, but the, the way I always try to approach it is that while the productivity and those kind of metrics are important, they should always they should always be brought forward in conjunction with some of these non kind of businessy metrics so that the clinician themselves feels like there's more to the conversation than we're not billing enough, we're not seeing enough patients, you need to be more productive. Because from a perception side of the of the clinician, like they want they got into healthcare because they wanted to help people. And whether they bill a 97110 or a 97530 doesn't really matter to them because they know in the session they're doing the right, you know, they're they're helping their patient. So it's kind of bridging that gap on the billing side and then also having kind of the longer tail vision of okay, it's not just about this patient or this month or this unit, it's about the the type of care you're providing. And my goal as a practice owner, as a consultant, is to make you the type of therapist that patients want to come and see and see for a long time, right? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So in the book, you outline eight changes that organizations and clinicians need to commit in order to focus on a healthcare where it's focused on the patient. So what are some of the other changes? And, and again, humans, don't always like change and practice yeah. owners and therapists exactly. don't always like change, but your book has eight of them. So what are some other ways? And even if um, owners listening don't like even to hear the word change because they know yeah. how challenging that would be for their, yeah. their team members and their practice. So even if they were slight variations or suggestions or, or adaptations, what are some other, what are some of those eight that we haven't already covered that could potentially yeah. help some of these owners? Yeah. So um, some of this stuff is very like we're already doing this, right? Like we're building meaningful relationships in the clinic most of the time. A lot of what's in the book is not, and I tell this to people all the time, it's not groundbreaking. It's not like I'm discovering a new sun. I'm not Copernicus over here. I'm just taking what we already do. And sometimes it's just flipping the order in which we do it. For example, like the way you handle a first call or an in inquiry call into your clinic or when you call to schedule a referral. Um, and even in your marketing too, we, we did a whole webinar on a on a what we call a bottom up approach, which is what happens in most healthcare environments is it's very top down. The organization or the clinician or the or the the or the the clinic itself has information that it needs. Right? We need your demographic, your date of birth, insurance if we're going to be billing insurance, or how you're going to pay, all of that kind of stuff. We're going to call the patient. We're going to get all this information, and then after we've gotten all that information. If there's time, <laughs> we'll ask the patient, okay, so what's going on with you? Okay, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you, yada, 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 done, hang up the phone. By simply flipping that upside down and starting from the bottom up, you're leaving the patient with a much more different experience. So calling the patient and saying, hey, so-and-so, you know, Dr. Smith sent over a referral for your shoulder pain. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what's going on? We get their narrative experience. We get their expectations for treatment. We get their goals for treatment. You know, what, what do you hope to get out of treatment? Okay, you want to be able to throw the baseball in the backyard with your grandchild without, you know, feeling the grinding and the popping and the clicking and the pain. Okay, well, let me see. If, you know, we can, we can certainly work with you on that, yada, yada, yada. You keep on going. And just that conversation naturally flows to build some of that trust and that likability, if you would, with a prospective patient before they even book an appointment. And I'll even train client staff, and I've trained my front office staff here at the at the clinic, um, just, you know, we get all this important stuff. And then we move on to like, okay, now, now we have to get the, the, the checkbox and stuff to get you scheduled, you know, what's your date of birth? You know, what's your insurance? What days work for you to get you on the schedule, yada, yada, yada. But the way you're framing it is that what is most important is all this stuff that we just talked about. How is, how, you know, what's going on with you? How's it impacting your life? What are the goals you have for treatment? Why would you even consider physical therapy in the first place and not an injection? You know, all that kind of stuff. We get that all taken care of. 
And then we get the demographics, the insurance, the billing, all of that kind of mundane administrative stuff second. And it's not like you're doing anything different. It's not like you're um, you end the call sometimes maybe with more information than you would have beforehand, but it's the same basic information. You got the patient scheduled, you got their billing information, you got their contact information. You just did it in a way that left the patient feeling like, oh man, this is much different. This is a much different experience than I get from any other healthcare provider that I go to, which are more worried about billing my insurance than finding out what's wrong with me, right? Right. And so then if patients in these clinics have that type of an experience, they're more likely to then show up and return and complete their plan of care. Yeah. And then write a, you know, a Google review or you do a video testimonial if the owner has that, or they take pictures and they put it on the wall as, you know, the, the wall of fame with testimonials and all that. Yeah. They're more likely to then ten, tell their friends and family and colleagues and, and folks about your clinic to then go there. So then it's a you know, like, it's a, a reinforced machine. Yeah. A, a self-feeding machine. So then it's helping that practice owner grow and, and potentially onboard new clients and patients without spending on ads or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And so then it go then it goes into the the financial side where it's potentially more revenue, more profit yeah. than that owner in the future. If that owner wants to sell, they're they're able to take what they've done and build better relationships and have more raving fans. And then they in the future, because of the the topic of you know my show with with yeah. selling and, and exiting and all that, then they could actually be in a better position to exit their practice and get top dollar or max value or whatever they're looking for because they've done the hard work in the trenches of building that good morale, that, that good team that delivers the good product. Exactly. Well, and you know, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. Like some of this stuff will require a little bit of time, a little effort, a little bit of investment. But the reality is, I don't know if you've done any work, well, you've probably done some work with PE firms. But PE firms, you know, the, when they come in to buy some, when they're consolidating and rolling up clinics, like they're looking for the areas that can be improved, the areas where they can easily come in, make a quick turnaround on profit, and then either sell that or roll that into another deal or whatever the, whatever they're planning on doing. So if they're looking at the clinic and they're like, listen, this clinic is doing you know a million dollars a year. Their EBITDA looks really good, but they're bleeding patients. Like you know, sixty percent of them aren't completing their course of care. This is an easy fix. Well, they're coming in with a lower offer because it's not right. operating at, at high capacity, and then they're able to turn around very quickly by making some of these changes, putting the investment in. And then they've increased the value that should have been the original or could have been the original owner's value. But because they didn't put the work in up front, they end up getting less of an less of an offer because they, you know, there's there's room for improvement. In terms of the team members, how much buy-in or or how much because you talked about like the time and effort, either way you're gonna pay for yeah. either, you know, with with money or it's gonna be time and effort. So what type of of a time or effort or timeline for some of this, some of the things might be quick fixes for some of these practices. And some are like, if you don't have this type of a humanistic offering, that would be yeah. kind of hard to change, right? Like if it's if it's a, a mill or a factory or something that's all about the numbers, that's going to be really difficult to change. So what are some thoughts or suggestions around that? It is. So yeah, so you can, um, there's a couple ways to do it. And it depends kind of where you're starting. Like if you're if you are a small private practice, maybe you have one, two, three locations. Once you start getting out of that, then you kind of do fall into the like becoming really competitive on a volume level. But what I see a lot of smaller private practices, they look at, I'm not going to name any of the big chains, but they see these, you know, mid regional or even national chains that have clinics on every corner. And those clinics are operating at a specific business model that is profitable for them because of their scale, right? these clinicians or these clinics will kind of fall into trying to copy that and then build success off of that, but they're just too small, right? So they're already kind of struggling. They're probably feeling like the money's not there when it needs to be because they're trying to they're trying to match on volume when they don't have the real the, either the capacity to make it work or the the actual volume of patients to make it work financially. So some of this is actually helpful because, because by introducing different areas, of revenue diversification or the offering that you have, your strategy, if you would, it does kind of alleviate some of that pressure anyways, because you're not trying to fit a square hole in a round peg, or, you know, square peg in a round hole. Um, but yeah, some of it does involve having a team meeting and saying, listen, like, this is why we got into healthcare. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of, without sounding super chintzy or cheesy, like, 
mission, vision, values, the higher purpose of the organization is important. And it's important for everything from recruiting staff to marketing to patients, because it should be the foundational piece that everything is built off of. So when you have that mission or that vision or that higher purpose the or, of the organization, it makes it easier to communicate to clients and to patients, but also to the staff and say, okay, like this is why I started Proactive, for example. This is why we're here doing this. That means that because this is our mission, though our mission at, at Proactive, for example, is to empower patients to become the drivers of their own healthcare. That means that we're going to do things that are more knowledge translation based, right? Like we're not going to do a whole lot of manual passive treatments. We will obviously use them if, if it's indicated, but that's not going to be the core component of our treatment plan. We want self-management. We want these patients getting better, getting independent in their home and self-management programs, um, creating educational content is a big piece of this. But because it's our foundational commitment is we're empowering patients to become drivers of their own healthcare. It makes it easier to communicate some of those changes to your staff and to your clinicians. Like, okay, because this is the organization that you work for and this is what we're doing, it's only a logical progression that we don't want to be building as much manual therapy as we are, you know, therapeutic activities or ADLs and self-management because that's that's the mission that we're trying to push and provide. Not only does it provide better long-term outcomes, but it's also financially more financially more sustainable as well. Um, but if you don't have that at the beginning, it's very difficult to just come in and just start making changes. So I always advise clients that I work with, like you need to get solid on the mission, vision, values, higher purpose, not because you're going to put it on a wall and not because you're going to like write a manual about it, but because it gives you almost the the logical or the kind of the moral uh, ability to make those changes and decisions without having to like justify them from a position of, okay, it makes us more money or there's no reason for us changing. I just think it's going to be better. Like you, you start with, this is our higher purpose. And then because of that, we're going to make these strategic decisions or procedural decisions that impact, you know, the way your job is done or the way you're going to do X, Y, Z, but it becomes more logical and people can understand it and follow it. If you come in and just say, I'm going to make all these changes and you don't really have anything underneath it, you're going to get a lot of pushback because people don't like change. <laughs> what, they're, what they're doing is working for them. Why would they change in any meaningful way? Because you haven't given them a reason to change. Hmm. And so now screen sharing the book on Amazon, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. Is this the main uh, the main place you want the audience to check it, the book out? I don't, I don't know. If, is it also listed on your consulting website or is it mostly just here on Amazon? It is on the consulting website. If you go to rehabupracticesolutions.com um, and click books, there's a, there's a page there that kind of gives you a little uh, information about it. And then we also... Um, we just got the audio uh, permissions or the audio rights back from the publisher, and we'll be creating an audible or an audio book version coming out just somewhere in 2023. It depends on when when I can get my team around putting it together. Awesome. So the uh, you got the audio book coming out, and this uh, this is a paperback, or is this yes. uh, Kindle? We got paperback, paperback. We got Kindle. Um, yeah, the publisher runs everything through. Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and something else. So they they tell everybody to, to funnel through Amazon. That's the best. They're usually the fastest shippers. <laughs> Excellent. And I know the main thing that we were talking about here is the book, but in terms of any of the, the ways that you help practice owners with consulting and whatnot, if there's a practice owner out there listening, like who's your ideal person to reach out to you that, you know, you best help or that you're, or that you're looking to help, whether it's a uh, solo practice owners, is it a, uh, practice owners with one or two locations or larger organizations like who's the who's the type of uh, client that you're looking to work with yeah i mean the type of clients that i like working with are privately held pt and ot clinics i mean ideally they've got some revenue behind them because you know we're trying to scale and grow what's already working um i have worked with a couple startups and while it's while it's beneficial i really like working with people that have a team around them right maybe it's one or two clinicians it doesn't need to be super super big up to you know five, six, seven clinic locations. Outside of that, then you're getting into big corporate stuff, which I've done some work in. It's just a, a lot harder to affect change at a corporate level than it is when you're talking directly with the CEO or the owner, right? 
Um, you can make right. changes a lot more quickly. It really impacts the, the type of care that's being delivered. And the reality is there's a lot of consolidation going on in healthcare. You know that right now. You're you're in the middle of acquiring practices. Right. And for the little guys, the guys that might have one, two, three clinic locations, um, really the the way to survive is going to be differentiating yourself somehow. And those are the kinds of clients that I really like working with. They don't want to sell to a big corporate chain. They want to maintain control over their organization and the type of care that's being delivered. I love working with those kind of folks. Those are great, great, great clinicians. Awesome. So this was How to Improve Profits Through Humanizing Healthcare with Rafi Salazar. Go ahead and check out Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare on Amazon or Rafi's main uh, consulting website. Anything else, Rafi, to, to wrap up in terms of how folks can reach out to you, whether LinkedIn, your website, email address, anything like that? Yeah, I'm pretty uh, active on LinkedIn. So Raphael E. Salazar 2 on LinkedIn um, or RehabUPracticeSolutions.com is, is my website. And there's links all there to email me, schedule a call, all of that. So Rehab, the letter U, PracticeSolutions.com. Excellent. Uh, congratulations on the book launch. You got it. Yeah. Paperback, Kindle, and the audiobook coming out soon. Forthcoming, uh, yeah. Any acquisitions on the horizon for you? You've acquired the practice before. If you guys haven't listened to the episode, uh, Rafi's first yeah. time on the show, we talked about his uh, his practice, the therapy practice in Augusta, Georgia that he acquired. Anything else on the horizon in regards to acquisitions or just kind of focusing on the, the book and the consulting right now? Focusing on the book and the consulting, there's always the, my first client when I was a consultant doing some healthcare marketing um, is actually looking at retiring and she's probably one of the larger competitors to me in my city. So we're you know, we're having talks, but nothing firm yet. No LOIs have been sent. <laughs> got it. Got it. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the book. Let's get it out there, folks. Let's get some reviews on it and uh, go on Amazon, get the book and leave Ravi a review. So um, that's it for the Kittle Show. Thank you guys for your time, your attention. And if you find this valuable and helpful content, take the link of this YouTube video, iTunes, Spotify link, whatever, text it or email it to one friend, one colleague that is business-minded, entrepreneurial, like yourself. And if you find it valuable, then chances are they're gonna find it helpful and valuable. So that's it for the Dave Kittle Show. We'll catch you next time, bye. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me, shoot me an email at Dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D A V E at C O N C I E R G E, painrelief.com. Or you can call me at any time, 646 781 8884.